Good morning, all, all y'all. Um, there's our liturgist arriving in. We are small but mighty ravaged by COVID, fortunately just ravaged in numbers and not in, you know, actuality. Good morning, Greta. Welcome, welcome. Big party, Big party here. With masks, um, if you all are vaccinated, symptom-free, and sitting far apart, I think we're okay. You all live in the same house, so it's not hard to socially distance today. Um, <clears throat> I think, honestly, between all the people who are recovering from COVID, recovering from a family member having COVID, or have COVID, we're just going to be small and mighty today, and we're going to have a great time. Uh, so happy Father's Day to all the dads. That would be <laughs> Pete at the moment. Mark's coming in. Um, and Rick is online. So what? And Terry, happy Father's Day. And happy Juneteenth. I'm not sure that's the appropriate greeting, but happy Juneteenth, is it? I know, June 17th, happy birthday. And um, we will have um, a brief congregational meeting at 1030 to elect an elder to fill a one-year term. And that can be attended on Zoom or in person, thank goodness. And we, the nominating committee has nominated Rick Hollis and he has agreed to serve. Faithful wayfinding, our team is being gathered and we should have an announcement about that very soon, but please keep us all in your prayers as that happens and stay tuned. Friday night is a poster making for Pride at Woodland Presbyterian. We'll be marching with the More Light churches in the Pride Parade if you'd like to do that. All you need to bring to Woodland is yourself. And I will, um, I believe that's from six to eight. And I, it's numbers, so I um, should be in the newsletter this week. You just need to bring yourself. You might want to tell me if you're planning to attend so that they know how much pizza to have. Pizza. Yeah, pizza. And um, then Saturday morning, we need to be there, um, I believe, at 8 9.15. Thank you. Greta knows things. Thank you, Greta. <laughs> at 9.15, um, the parade will be at 8th and Broadway. We are slot number 23. Um, and you can just look for the More Light banner for that. Oh, okay. Easy peasy. Greta says it will be marked in white tape on the sidewalk so you can find us. And by the time you get close, you will see familiar faces. Um, I think that's it. Any questions about any of that? Any other announcements? It's maybe so. Okay. Let's worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. So again, happy Father's Day. We rejoice with you. To all who struggle on Father's Day for whatever reason, we see you. We are continuing in our, um, our um, <laughs> series on the Ten Commandments. Today we're going to look at the first four commandments, and they are called the vertical commandments sometimes because they deal with how we respond to God. And we'll find, like all the commandments, that they are not just vertical, they are also horizontal, and that they all come from within this covenant of freedom and love. And um, they all can be summed up in Jesus' two commandments, to love God and love our neighbor. So let's worship. <laughs> Sitting for you, and we thank Mark for filling in for Rick. <laughs> Come sing praises to God, rejoice in his presence, for he is our God. 
a father to the fatherless, and the defender of all who need protection, the one in whom the lonely find a home and the prisoner finds release. Bless the Lord, the God of our salvation, who sustains and strengthens us day after day. Let us worship together. of confession and assurance of forgiveness. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future where we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Help us hear you in the silence. Amen. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, Amen. Hear the teaching of Christ. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. God, open our hearts, minds, and souls that we may hear you. Silence any voice in us but your own so that we may clearly hear you in what you are calling us to do. The first scripture reading is from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Really, really love that song. 
All right. Well, CJ. Are you all okay with me not being masked? Because I can go get a mask. Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to do the commandments. I'm gonna, we're all going to do them together. Get your fingers ready because we're going to do the first four. First commandment. How many gods do we have? One. One. And God comes first. All right? Number two. Two. When we hold up two fingers, it looks like scissors. And that helps us remember we don't make any idols. We don't make anything and say, this is God, right? And it means we don't put anything in God's place because that's idolatry and God really doesn't like that. And we don't like to say, this is what God is because God fits in this shape because God needs to be free to be God. Three, what letter does that look like? A W, yes. Three means we, it kind of looks like a butterfly. It does. But for this, this lesson, it's a W, and it means that there is a word that we are very careful with. And that word, word, exactly. There are words that we are careful with, and that word is God's name. And we don't just throw around God's name, and we don't go around saying, just any old thing about God. We're careful with that and we treat that as something special and holy. So we don't go around saying, I know God better than you do. And I know what God wants you to do. Things like that. So we're careful with God's name. Fourth one, what are these four fingers doing? They're moving. What is this four? What is this finger doing? It is sitting, it is resting. And the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And you know what? Do you think God needs to rest? No, but you know that God did. God made the world. It said, the Bible tells us in six days and on the seventh day, God rested. And then God turned around and said, I made you to need rest too. And so... Every seven days, everybody gets a rest. Not just the people who own the stuff, not just the people who take care of the stuff, but all the stuff, all the things God made get a rest. All right. So you want to try them again? What's the first commandment? How many gods do we have? And what place does God have? The first place. Two. What do we not do? Well, we don't cut each other, and we'll say that. But what else do we not do? We don't make any, anybody? We don't make any idols or any other gods. Three. What are we careful with? God's name. And number four. What's this guy doing? He's resting. We remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Some people celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday. We celebrate it on Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And CJ, watch out because there is a thing on fire behind you. So please don't. Maybe it's on fire. I don't think it's on fire anymore. But either way, be careful. All right, friends, let's hug our hands together and say a prayer. Dear God. Thank you for the commandments, for the way that they keep us loving you and loving each other well. Amen. Bye. <laughs> Oh, they kind of cracked me. Okay, we can get organized here. So, as you may have guessed, we're going to talk about the first four commandments today. And we call them vertical because they tell us how we are to behave toward God as compared to the horizontal commandments that tell us how to behave toward one another. So, a quick recap. 
The Hebrew people have been freed from slavery in Egypt. They're just beginning to learn what it means to be God's chosen people. And what they and we figure out pretty quickly is God is not messing around. This is a big, huge deal to God. God is all in on this covenant thing. And God lays out some expectations, some rules for how this is going to work. These vertical commandments we just went through. One God comes first. That back on. Yes, okay. One God who comes first, no idols, no misusing God's name, and honoring the Sabbath. They are deceptive to not How about that? Yay. Okay. Thank you, Bethany. All right. So these are deceptively easy to ignore, right? Love God. Yeah, I got that. God comes first. Sure. Idols. Nah. Pretty sure I'm good there. God's name. What does that even mean? And Sabbath? I'm here, aren't I? We spend way more time on those horizontal commandments. You know, don't kill, don't lie, don't steal. Most of our legal codes are written on those horizontal commandments. It's only our religious institutions that try to put strict rules and codes around the vertical commandments. And you know what? Problems arise when these expectations that God has laid out in love and freedom get misused and misinterpreted, not for love and freedom and covenant, but for controlling people and even for abusing them. When God's invitation to a covenant based on freedom and love is turned into weaponized fear-mongering that is then used to create shame and dismay, those expectations originally expressed in love become painfully oppressive. When God's love for us, God's longing to be in relationship with us, when those things are treated as a commodity that gets meted out in little doses like treats for good behavior, the commandments that started out as these loving expectations become searing burdens that leave, that, that leave painful scars. So a fresh look at what God expects of us and what God acts of, asks of us when God says, love God, love neighbor, can be an invitation into a conversation about how these can be life-giving and not life-draining. It can give us a chance to get a renewed look at what it means to be part of a family of faith where belonging doesn't mean perfection, but it means flopping Godward together. So let's listen to what God's word has for us today. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 11 from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Quick history lesson. The Revised Standard Version came out in 1946. The New Revised Standard Version came out sometime in the, I think, 80s. And then the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition came out in 2021. That's what we're reading from. (laughs) I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, 
but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses God's name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested at the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. The word of God for the people of God today. So that whole thing begins with a proclamation. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. So it's fitting that we are talking about the foundation in freedom on June 19th, on Juneteenth. This is a momentous day in our nation's history. It's the day when the news of the end of slavery, the news of emancipation reached the last people still enslaved. Juneteenth is an opportunity for all of us to celebrate the end of people legally owning other people in our nation, something we can all celebrate. And after God reminds them of this freedom, God begins to tell them how this covenant of love and freedom is going to work, starting with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Some versions put it this way, you shall have no other gods besides me. So the basic idea is that we have one God and that's it. This is a God who is intimately connected with the history of this people. As verse two reminds them, I'm the one who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Let me put it like this. We have one God, God comes first above all else, right? That makes all kinds of sense. But if we're honest, we will probably over and over put something in that place something in that place that only God should occupy. Even if we do it unintentionally and look and go, oh nuts, I did it again. But when we also over and over look and say, oh nuts, I did it again. And we put God back into that rightful place. We learn something important. We learn over and over what it means to be set free from inferior gods, false gods that do not love us, and false gods that do not want any kind of covenant with us. And this commandment, like all the others, isn't just vertical. When we fail to put God first, and then other things, money, career, beauty, tradition, anything else that takes God's place, our neighbors will ultimately pay the price for our idolatry in the kinds of things we prioritize, and the kind of love that we live out. A great example I heard was this. There was a man who wanted his lawn to be pristine. He wanted to impress his neighbors with this weed-free, perfectly edged swath of green. There was nothing wrong with that except for the way he treated his kids when they ran across it or played on it. And his wife finally said to him, honey, you need to get over it because we're raising kids, not grass. By taking the lawn out of that first place, the kids got to be in their rightful place, somewhere above the state of the lawn and below the place of God. Things got put in their right places. So these really are vertical, I mean, horizontal as well as vertical. So the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. Now, the cultures all around the ancient Hebrew people, they had gods for all these different realms. They had the sky gods, the sea gods, the under the sea gods. You know, the Babylonians had Tiamat, the god of chaos, etc., etc. 
So God is making clear that the God who is making a covenant with them is none of those gods. This God cannot be contained in an image or a statue. No idol will sufficiently convey who and what God is. And God is also saying with this command that we don't get to put limits on how God lives and how God works, that we have to let God be free and alive and not try to put God into something of our own making. We don't get to make idol boxes and stick God into our idol boxes. And then there's that uncomfortable part about the jealous God. Sometimes we get stuck on that because we've been told so often that God is basically really mad at us and just waiting for a reason to stomp us and squash us like bugs. But let's look at it a little more closely. It looks like it's saying God is punishing us for what our parents did. And we want to say, hey, wait, no fair. Because our American legal code says you cannot be tried for someone else's crime, right? Okay, hang in there. It says this, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, the real point of that phrase in verse five and six is that God is many, many times more endure, God's grace is more enduring than God's judgment, thousands of times more. Now, it's true. God hates idolatry. Let's be clear about that. But let's not miss the trees for the weeds. Our idolatry does affect our neighbors and our children and our children's children, showing us again the way we love God has huge implications for the way we love our neighbors. So if I, let's say, am battling an addiction, we all know from loving people or battling addictions ourselves that that becomes first. And we also know that that idolatry will impact children and children's children. But we also know that God's grace, from what this says, impacts thousands of generations as well. So the third commandment, that tricky, we don't just throw God's name around. We're careful with God's name. We use God's name with reverence. Well, that horizontal effect, when we have some reverence and humility about using God's name, we might be less likely to put God's name on things that are really just our own pet projects or our own policies or our own platforms. Ironically, what came to mind for me was the idea that we should post the Ten Commandments publicly because to me that's taking them out of context because they belong in a context of love and relationship and covenant and I don't understand how slapping them on a wall is going to do a whole lot that people don't already know. And to me, that might be, I am willing to be argued with, but that might be taking God's name and using it for someone's own purposes to control someone else. That's probably going to get me in trouble, but oh well. So the fourth commandment, just eight words. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But then it gets this long explanation in the scripture. It's like God saying, no, no, really, I mean it. Nobody works on the Sabbath. Everybody rests. Yes, everybody. Yep, him too, them as well. Nope, not kidding. One commentary I looked at called this the first fair labor law, insisting that all that God created was entitled to rest. Now, if we combine Jesus's words love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. With these words in Exodus, we can easily surmise that loving God means keeping the Sabbath. Well, what does that mean in a 21st century world? What would happen if just for a few hours we could turn the world off each week to figure out what rest means and do that? 
to listen to birds or waves or a river or rain, to breathe deeply and let our shoulders sink down from their perpetual place up around our ears, to eat simple good food with people we love without any screens being on to distract us. And what if we kept it up each week and little by little we got a little better at being quiet together at being together, at resting, at Sabbath. What, what could God pour into us in such a time, into such a practice? What might we take back into our lives from such a time? And the, and the Sabbath is not just a rest. It's also a time to make space for God and to consistently create time and opportunity for wonder, for worship, for community for things that cultivate the God life within us, the things that help us find and walk the Christ line together. And again, this is not just vertical. The Sabbath is something we do together in community. Now our family tried over the years to keep some kind of Sabbath. And sometimes we did it really well and sometimes not so much to be honest. But because we tried and sometimes got it okay, we have some great memories of walks by the Harpeth River that we wouldn't have if we hadn't tried. We have laughter that echoes in our hearts and minds from playing games. We have some really ridiculous inside jokes about hymns from sitting in a pew together Sunday after Sunday. I forget which hymn it is, but there's a verse that starts, silently now I wait for thee. Everyone, mark me and both our kids and probably their spouse and fiance now will all go, instead of going, silently now we'll all go, now I wait for thee, and just get ourselves all tickled because you know we think we're so funny. But that's because we had to sit in a pew together and giggle. And we share long, long histories with a church family at Hillsboro Presbyterian Church where we raised our kids. Investing in sharing faith with a church family means that over seasons and years, we serve together and we worship together, we grieve together, we brought each other meals and celebrated each other's triumphs and held each other close in loss. So even that commandment about the Sabbath is not just vertical. So when taken within this framework of love and freedom, this covenant, the commandments that Jesus summed up into what he called the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, we can see that these vertical commandments end up helping us love our neighbors, that second commandment as well. Amen. I was joking with Bethany, and she came in, and she said, wow, they're so quiet. And I was saying, they might think I'm eavesdropping, but I'm half deaf. So I'm, oh, cool. you know, I can't hear a word they're saying, except Forrest, because he's at that deep resonant voice. And if Pete's facing this way, I can hear Pete. But other than that, y'all can say all kinds of things about me. But I won't know. All right, let's prayerfully turn to thoughts of generosity and stewardship. And I thought today, rather than going through all the things we usually say, I want to say why we do this this way. There are, um, you know, traditionally in churches, they pass a plate. And um, that has been around since, gosh, colonial times, probably. But before that, it was normal for people to bring their crops, part of things like that, into the church, into, you know, to sell part of something and then bring that money. And it wasn't necessarily a weekly thing. And when we began Telos, the first iteration of what this nine o'clock service is, we thought it seemed silly to pass a plate to people who never carried cash or checks. That seemed unrealistic. So we created an electronic way to do giving QR code and wanted to expand our idea of what stewardship and generosity is, and then began our, pro our usual thing of 
we think in terms of kindness, time, privilege, help, all the ways we can be generous, all the things over which um, we have been charged with stewardship. So that's why we do it that way. Any questions? I mean, we're just a small bunch here, so. Okay. Um, why don't we sing our next hymn and then we'll go to a time of prayer. of prayer requests, we have a lot of them. Um, seems like half the church has COVID right now. So Jamie and Amber both have COVID. And um, Eli and Jamie Young have COVID. Andy is taking care of them. <laughs> Rick has COVID, Karen Hollis has COVID. That's all I know. Am I missing anyone that you can know so? Okay. Um, I know Caroline had COVID and uh, Bethany and I were talking that if you have, Caroline has COVID, that means everybody's quarantined for five days, but then if four days later, somebody else test positive, you know, you can see in a family of four that they could spend a month being quarantined. So you can still be praying for the Cummings. Um, I got to see um, baby Emmy Jo on Friday and she looks like a tiny bald Kayla. And she's very, very cute, but they are doing well. Um, just, you know, brain baby fog and no sleep and all of that. But we need to be praying for them. Um, Bob Tate, who some of you know, some of you do not, he comes with Annette Hendricks. He um, lives in Chattanooga and comes up here several days a week. Um, his son passed away um, this week from complications of diabetes. He was, Annette wasn't sure whether he was 59 or 60 years old, but we need to be in prayer as they um, make arrangements and begin that hard path of grieving. Um, he was a career Navy um, person and will probably be buried at sea 
Um, anyway, we need to just keep them in our prayers since he's the oldest of Bob's children. Are there other prayer requests? Kim. For the Joe Strickland family, as they walk out, just a hard, hard path of grief. What? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. Just draw. That's all we need to hear. Can help us know a little bit more how to pray. Are there others? Bethany. Tommy Bell passed away yesterday. Oh, okay. Tommy Bell, who um, visited here, passed away um, yesterday, he said. Early yesterday morning. Early yesterday morning. Do you know of any arrangement? Okay. I'm very sorry to hear that. Any other any on Zoom, Jen? Okay. It's, um, I'm going to go ahead and fold these all into our prayer time. Gracious God, you are bigger than big and larger than large and more awesome than awesome can describe. We gather to give you thanks for your presence in our lives, for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the movement of the Holy Spirit among us. We pray for all those in our congregation suffering from COVID, struggling to get better, dealing with the joy of new babies. Lord, we pray for the Judd Strickland family, for the drama, for the grief. And we pray, Lord, for um, the Tate family as they grieve this loss, Michael. And Lord, we pray for Tommy Bell's family as they begin to walk this hard path of grief. Heavenly Father, you entrusted your son Jesus, the child of Mary, to the care of Joseph, an earthly father. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer fuller be. God bless all fathers as they care for their families, give them strength and wisdom, tenderness and patience, support them in the work they have to do, protecting those who look to them as we look to you for love and salvation through Jesus Christ, who is our rock and our defender. Oh, joy that seeketh me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. The morning shall has God, we lift again to you all the requests made aloud here and also those made in the quiet of our hearts that are known only to your heart. Bringing them all to you, we join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
So friends, may God, our glorious Father, open the eyes of your heart that you may see the hope to which he is calling you, the richness of the inheritance for which he has prepared you, and the power that is at work among you. Go in the grace of God. Amen. <laughs>